Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have the one, the only, Chuck Beatty. Chuck, welcome to the show. Well, thanks very much, Jeff. Some people say that David Miscavige and Pat Broker cut L. Ron Hubbard's communication lines and they, that's how Miscavige took over the church. Do you see it that way or do you see that L. Ron Hubbard personally picked Miscavige to take over? I know, he, I know he did not pick Miscavige. I know he did not pick him. Uh, uh, the way it went was for the mission all clear, I believe um, whoever were the, the top people on the mission all clear uh, – made mistakes in some way so that Miscavige rose to the, be the top position. He became, and then the traffic from L. Ron Hubbard to that group of people that were dealing with the same problems that the Mission All Clear people were dealing with. I, I myself have not entirely wrapped my wits around this only because it, it takes a good deal of concentration. So one of the big things was Geo was saying, uh, LRH, the way you're doing the money, illegal. We got to fix that. Denise Brennan fixes it. <laughs> ASI, here we go. This is how we do it. This is how we make it legal. The guys that the guys in CMO went, they're not worried about that. They're half worried about where is LRH tonight, make sure that he's he's not going to be process served or nobody's going to nab him any place and, and 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 bring him before the court. You know what I mean? There are the people wow. that are. I mean, like what LRH is involved with mentally on a daily basis may not be all of the important things that he needs to even be thinking about. I mean, like here's the thing: like a lot of people solve things for LRH. Because LRH was just clueless about some of the stuff that he was doing to himself and to the movement. So other people went ahead and solved these things as best they could following his orders. So I would say that even he himself uh, had lived so long a, a life as this sort of leader of this movement above the law that it was just part of his operating thinking. So, you know, he, he always felt he, he was like the Teflon Don who could always get out of everything but, you know, it wasn't true. He, he almost got nabbed, by, you know, when Mary Sue went down. And she had to basically bite the bullet, like you said. Otherwise, he could have gone down, too, if she'd have been honest. I'm sure she was asked questions, which had she had answered uh, honestly, um, I'm not sure exactly how the questioning went on. But had she, she'd have to say, yeah, he, 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 he was the one who issued that order. He's the one who he knew about this one. He knew about this one. And uh, – I told him I was going to do this when he asked me, uh, how am I handling this? I told him, I this, you know, if, if we were to actually hear order by order by order by order, every single one of those operations, which were, you know, the legal, legal break ins of the government, you know, the yes. and so forth. Uh, absolutely. His, his, he's going to have responsibility there. It could have been, you know, uh, you know, m more charged or more, you know, affected legally than just being the unindicted co-conspirator, in my opinion. So there's a lot of chaos in the church with the, the, the dismantling of the guardian's offices, Ms. Cabbage's term. And a vacuum, of, a vacuum of truly yeah. people that can figure out what to do. I mean, Denise Brennan was a really, uh, really worked it out right there. Now, there were willing other members like Mark Yeager, in my opinion, was a was a pretty good commanding officer back at that time period. In fact, there was no specific LRH order padding, and I've read the author services advice, as we were going to talk about that at some point. And there was, there is no, there's, I think there's 23 or 27 specific, what are called chairman of the board ASI dispatches from Hubbard to him. None of them are like, oh, it's all over to you. You take over the reins now. Uh, nothing like that. You would have to, you'd have to be sort of like this meticulous reader between the lines to see how Miscavige has by uh, other people falling by the wayside right at that critical time period when some people um, were defecting and were and LRH was upset so therefore some people's heads had to be chopped and those people's heads got chopped and then Miscavige moved up to be that critical position of the one who received the communication from Pat Broker uh, who was the, with Annie with LRH at, at that time you have to have these people that are willing that are totally dedicated to do what LR, whatever LRH says and really think their way around it and Miscavige's personality is just that type he's that you know give him a job and he'll get it done 
You know what I mean? He's like he's like a he's like a go getter. It's going to get done. You know, he's like, you know, he's like demanding. He's like uh, when you're a Commodore's messenger, your air and attitude is executing LRH's orders. And he was probably stronger on that part than he was on the image and presenting the PR image of LRH. You know what I mean? He had listened. He had, as he apprenticed under LRH and heard LRH's raging and sort of forth and running things on the film crew set, he probably carried with him, and that fits his personality. So that's what that's the way I extrapolated it. And he had this sort of like confidence and feeling that he was in the position to sort of and and when the other I think it was during that mission all clear thing when he was when he went from action chief CMO Ant to being on that mission all clear or whatever mission that was and then transitioned from that to becoming what was called a special unit in charge which was the aftermath of the uh, all clear unit and then he went from I guess SUIC to COBASI when ASI was fully formed in 1981 or 82. So that whole little period there does need to be detailed a little bit better, but there is no there is no writing from Ellerate saying, "Yeah, David, I want you to be my guy at ASI." I mean, he he was accepted as the guy for ASI. We'd have to ask Terry Gamboa how that was. Uh, when I asked her, she uh, when I asked her one time, I, I've not had a lot of conversations with her, but she did say that he's just been COB everything from day one. So from the moment that they had that initial conversation, but Terry, Janice, the, there were Lois, Dee Dee, they all had much more uh, time, spent much more time communicating back and forth with LRH than David did, David Miscavige. David Miscavige didn't have a lot of traffic. If you were to like, if we were to put into the public domain all of the LRH traffic from that time period, there, there aren't, I mean, when he was a messenger, he had nothing from LRH. There wasn't any communication. He was just the, he was just the guy who was, was sent out to, to meet up with Pat Broker in the parking lots to, to receive the relay of LRH communication, which was coming uh, from Pat Broker down to wh whoever the representative was at the Ent base, and that was David Miscavige. He was the guy who was designated to go pick it up. If readers go to Google or Steve Hall's blog, Scientology-Cult.com, there's an article called The Secret History of David Miscavige, and it's written by the Gang of Five. Totally important. Those Gang of Five are – they're all those people that were there at the moment when crazy uh, Miscavige was taking that uh, – breaking that telephone. The story that gets related, uh, late 1980, David Miscavige has a major asthma attack. Paul Grady takes him to the hospital emergency room, and – if you remember going back to 38, L. Ron Hubbard had a dental surgery. He was under a dental gas. Yeah, of course. He, he, he relates to this. He had his out of the body experience. Yeah, this big revelation where the dynamic principle of existence is survive. Well, fast forward to 1980, David Miscavige is allegedly in an emergency room with a, uh, an asthma attack that might kill him. He comes back from this experience and tells Paul his big cognition or revelation is power is assumed. And look, parallel these two things. Hubbard's big revelation survives the dynamic principle of existence, which, by the way, never amazed me because survival is just Darwinian. Nevertheless, David Miscavige's revelation is power is assumed, which I interpret to mean it's there for the taking. It's there for the taking, whoever you have to walk over, knock over, all over, you know, blackmail, push out of the way, shove, silence, gag, get them out of the way, and you can take all the power. So it's almost as if due to a confluence of really significant events, plus, Chuck, what you have to add in, Miscavige isn't smart enough to do this himself. And he's young. He's he, 16 or 17. He doesn't know the history. He doesn't know policy. He's not really a tech person. I think the story is about how bad he is. He is not like some sort of role model. And then on the other hand, he's following in the footsteps of Hubbard, who himself, look at Hubbard. Is, is Hubbard the role model of a, of a religious movement? No. I mean, like all of his all of Hubbard's solutions are, are just so foreign to the operation of a normal religion. So therefore, uh, he, uh, Hubbard is frustrated when things aren't getting done the way he wants them. And he's been the one who's been. <laughs> who uh, uh, responsible for the policies which keep it in this sort of permanently, you know, tried Keystone Cops type of operation. So then a hard-charging little guy like 
like Miscavige thinks, yeah, I'll assume power and, and cut the Gordian knots every which way and get things done the way Ron says. And that's basically his only sort of uh, daylight to uh, what would be, quote, survival at that moment and getting Hubbard's, you know, attention and Hubbard's approval. Yeah, that's that's basically the the, the scenario I see. When Miscavige moved from ASI over to uh, RTC, RTC. Uh, when he when he when he moved when he moved over there to really assume and replace Vicky Asneran as the COB RTC um, and really sort of redo RGC, he took all the power with him. He basically was still calling the shots. I know when I was there from ninety two to ninety five, Miscavige still had a log on, and his log on was titled Chairman of the Board, Author Services Incorporated, and Shelley uh, uh, was always a COB assistant. Uh, ASI. So she had a log on and he had a log on into ASI and he was never replaced. Like his his position of COB ASI was never replaced at Author Services. When Miscavige moved from ASI to uh, RTC to take over from Vicky Azran was was sort of, uh, I guess, being scapegoated for whatever was going wrong there at that time. Or maybe she was just not running to the normal frustrations that any top manager in, in Scientology runs into after a certain point. You basically you, you basically can't figure out what to do next because, you know, the Hubbard system pretty much stifles. Yeah, solution. what do you do? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So Vicky was like, and then so Miscavige came over to, to replace her. But I think Marty explains this a little bit better in Marty's book because Marty was a legal guy at his side. He went with, uh, I mean, basically all the top people of ASI all moved over to RTC. Marian, um, oh God, what's her name? Marian Dendu moved moved over. Greg Mil Wilhair moved over. I mean, COB with his two right hand people, that was Greg Wilhair and Marty. They they all moved over to RTC from ASI. So the power. Chuck, would it? Yeah. Chuck, question. Chuck, would it be correct to say that Author Services was like the proto RTC? Or no, pre RTC. No, 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 no. No? no, it would be better. It, I've, I've. My point is that ASI was truly like the the Denise Brennan solution to the illegality that was happening prior. It was mainly set up to provide LRH with an income, a legal income uh, source uh, from his uh, properties. You got to realize that LRH considered his his starting the the Church of Scientology almost. As if it's just one of his things he's done here on Earth. He wanted to, he wanted to get legal, uh, sort of like a recompense for his contributions to Scientology. So therefore, the, the, if you were to go into the filing cabinets at Author Services in the Treasury Branch, they have these filing cabinets, and in there are, are all the paper, the paper legal agreements with all of the entities which actually funnel money to Author Services, the royalty agreements, the various license agreements, and so forth. And uh, the Treasury people in ASI are constantly now legally, uh, you know, demanding and getting the the money which are signed by the other church corporations and front group corporations, I think all, all of those legal agreements are, are the agreements by which our author services legally gets the money from those other entities. This raises a good question. In, in 1982, according to Russell Miller, L. Ron Hubbard collected $40 million just one year yep. from all the Scientology related entities. I think, I think that the details of that are in the Homer Shomer uh, testimony. And uh, the interviews and the information that's gotten from Homer Schomer, who was the Treasury guy ASI, again uh, Terry Gamboa would be would like the the whole reason for sending the PIs after the the Las Vegas group of defectors Terry Janice, Paul, uh, Kenny Lipton, uh, Jeff Walker, um, Mark Fisher that the group that that sort of coalesced in Las Vegas the ex members there was the fear that uh, Terry. Who, who was firsthand to all of this would spill the beans and uh, that would jeopardize the 1993 tax um, accomplishment that Scientology acquired from the IRS. And absolutely, she would have blown the beans. I, absolutely, that would have been uh, – that would have been – that could have been the deciding factor that the IRS just said, sorry, we, we'd like to play ball with you, but – you, you guys, but for the testimony here, it's just not, it's, we can't do it. You know, the evidence that, that Terry could have provided probably would have doomed the IRS uh, granting, uh, you know, whatever it was that they granted in 1993. I don't know how I technically call that. 
Well, just tax 501c3 status. So your opinion, Chuck, is that if uh, Terry Gambo and a few other people hadn't been kept under watch by Miscavige, they could have uh, derailed tax exemption. But you've got to realize the mindset that, that she and virtually all of us felt. We thought, like, are you kidding? Is it great? Is it the, is it, it's the greater good for all of humanity? She wouldn't even conceive, I think, of jeopardizing the church's right to gain tax exempt status. I do believe that she was still, I mean, mentally, all of us, when you leave, are still so much of a player in this big Hubbard narrative that you wouldn't really think that the world is right and Hubbard is wrong. You know what I mean? You would think that it would be more right. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So I don't think that I'm pretty sure that she she it didn't she did never entertain that idea. So but even though she could have she could have been that she could have been the I think the guy's name was Michael Meisner, who was the G.O. guy who then led the, the, the massive raids on the church. I mean, she could have been uh, the sort of Michael Meisner for undoing that 1993 agreement. And I think Marty is correct. And then I totally agree with you. I don't know when you mentioned it, but his third book is so is so chock full of such important history. Oh, for uh, Scientology Watchers, Marty Rathbun's third book, Memoirs of the Scientology Warriors, Indispensable for Legal History. Now, going back to Homer Schomer, Homer Schomer uh, told Richard Behar, uh, and this is Richard uh, writing for the Los Angeles Times, I'm sorry, Forbes magazine, October 27, 1986. Homer said that uh, Hubbard was pulling in $1 million per week through ASI in 1982. And only the Treasury people that were on in those positions would know the exact details of how that was done. I, I can give you a you know a five minute answer to that question alone, and mention a lot of names, and then basically show you how over the history the Treasury people in the various Scientology related groups all coordinated and worked together to do whatever was being whatever came down from on high, and for sure that was the case. Well, why don't you give us the five-minute answer? I'm real intrigued how this all works. I didn't. I, I I don't know whether we've talked yet about like the whole earlier administrative structures prior to the the Denise Brennan sort out. The Denise Brennan sort out put Homer on the legal side of things. So now, go, now going earlier though, just for listeners who are not familiar with Scientology history, by about. After the church was raided in 1977 in Operation Snow White, it was clear that things were a mess. The IRS had found Hubbard guilty of inurement. That is, they denied tax exemption. They didn't criminally charge him. And things needed to be sorted out, sorted out to get Hubbard money legally. Yes. Correct? Correct. And, and, and on my wish list for the rest of my life would be for Herbie Parkhouse. Uh, some of the people who absolutely, like Herbie Parkhouse was shot from guns finally, I think in 1982. Herbie was the assistant guardian for finance. In other words, the sort of guardian's office disciple for finance. Uh, and then his predecessor, both at the GO and around the world, and then how, and then the, the people that were directly from the LRH accounts, um, uh, part of the personal the purse office, the LRH purse office, they would know as well, and Homer. I mean, there's there's going to be a handful of, of like four or five people that would know. Where I'd love to talk to Herbie Parkhouse. I don't even know if he's available. I, I know that in 1982, according to Richard Behar, Hubbard supposedly sold some or all of his copyrights for $85 million. According to Behar, uh, there was this was done in a way to create offsetting deductions, yeah. which... Behar says made the sale effectively tax-free. Now, David Miscavige, according to Behar, uh, authorizes this transaction. So, you know, back in 86, and I want to give our listeners an idea of the money moving through. Just in 1982 dollars, Forbes could find $200 million moving through ASI or Hubbard's name. You know, which in... in and I don't, know, I don't know what the inflation factor is, but let's just call it a billion dollars, you know, from 82 to 2014. So there's a, a monumental, staggering amount of money. Uh, and David Miscavige is there as chairman of the board, author services. 
Incorporated. And the church is trying to affect huge cash flows to Hubbard. And Hubbard's wanting to fund the church's spiritual technology. And it looks like in that time period, 82 forward, was ASI really the war room of the entire church where everything went down? Oh, absolutely. Terry Gambeau would absolutely confirm that. No question about it. Like, for instance, I was on the, the routing forms project. Uh, Paul Grady, who was the Action Chief CMO Int at that time in 1983, and I think his direct predecessor was Miscavige as the Action Chief when before uh, Miscavige went off. And I think Paul had been the Action Chief for a while there. And uh, I remember whenever Miscavige would show up, uh, he would dress as like captain and dre dress in his captain regalia and walk down the hallways of uh, of Del which was then the management building at the Int base. Del Sol top floor used to contain uh, Watchdog Committee and all the CMO Int people. And then the, the first floor contained uh, part of uh, CMO Int, and then it contained the exec strata. So basically the two top councils of Scientology were all in that Del Sol building, which today is the, the auditing building at the Int base, like like um, Mark Headley's uh, Blown for Good book shows in the in the in the door flaps and I mean on right. the book flaps. But anyway, uh, he he would dress like a Sea Org member, and yet he was coming as C O B A S I. This was 1983, so therefore, and I can tell you that um, he was he he was he was higher than C O C M Wint, which was Mark Yeager, and he was the other cap. He was another captain, and then in E D N T uh, Guillaume Leserve, he was also a captain at that time. Those are I believe were the three genuine top captains of the movement, and there was no question that COBASI, um, and this is this is when Vicky Asteran or Steve Marlowe, or I can't remember who was the actual head of RTC at that time, this, that I, they were also a captain. I think, I think Vicky was also considered a captain, but she was not superior to Miscavige. Miscavige was still the, the always the top guy, and that's one thing Terry Gamboa will tell you. The command channel right. booklet is, would, will make it clear you will see that RTC, it goes RTC, CMO Int, Exec Strata. Exec Strata is basically just a subsection on the international headquarters organization chart at that time, and the international organization is dominated by the CMO International, and RTC is off to the side. Now, and there's always these other factors, like in, a, in, a, in the power that any in, that, that's inherent in the mind of any C organization member also depends on their understanding of who they are and their full level of responsibility and the full understanding of all the other positions. And I got to tell you, a lot of the people in RTC just didn't know what the hell was going on. A lot of these, I mean, and that unfortunately is the case. Like when you talk, listen to uh, Denise Brandon talk about Miscavige, he didn't know he didn't know dirt anything about it. His operating basis was uh, like he was just a powerful. A uh, person who could force things to be complied with, and he w he was operating like as that sort of uh, uh, Commodore's messenger on steroids, and he had the power on, at all times in any position that he ever held uh, from that period when he kind of assumed that I think I don't know if we talked about it when he was the when he assumed that top position of the missional clear or the uh, SUIC uh, special unit in charge, basically the one who was on the uh, the mission in charge of the whole base too. I think he was also for. For some brief period of time, the SUIC, meaning the special unit in charge, he was like the he was the top guy who made all the decisions for everything. And, and as soon as he became SUIC or this mission all clear in charge, um, you know, the exact dates and months and weeks when this this all transpired, that was it. That was the moment that he assumed power. I think uh, that not just to state that a little bit more clearly, clearly. When Miscavige assumes power. What, what year was that? I believe that was 81. So he's effectively, uh, L. Ron Hubbard will live for another five years, and Miscavige is effectively in charge. If you look at the actual organization structure, I know there's Watchdog Committee, you know, Exec Strata, all that. On paper, who was supposed to be in charge? You ask. You ask questions like nobody in history of Scientology, so I have to commend oh, you. Thank you. You are the most... Uh, interesting questioner I've ever heard, and I've wasted the 10 years of my life since quitting, <laughs> quitting the Sea Org, keeping track of all the ups and downs of everything, and you truly are, are asking the most serious and, and in-depth questions of anyone alive. I mean, bar well, Tony Ortega. You, Tony Chuck. Ortega <laughs> is right the heck up there, too, of course, but, but you are patiently asking a lot of really good questions, okay? I just want to say that. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. And 
what I'm trying to arrive at in asking questions is, you know, what what's really going on? A few observations real quick. The IRS didn't know how to ask the right questions, in my opinion. That's why the church got tax exemption. They needed a Michael Meisner, and and I've concluded that the Justice Mm -hmm. Department and FBI, when they go after, like, uh, they need a Sammy the Bull. They need a a full-blown defector that'll go in there and just rip out the guts of the the group they're trying to take down. And they need to come out with all the goods so that they can just slam dunk the case. (laughs) And this is what I'm trying to do on the Scientology Money Project. They need a Janet... McLaughlin, like the lady who they was do. the eye. they need they need a couple of these guys to just go in and be martyrs, maybe do a couple of years of jail time for any of the stuff that they've done. And you got to come out in untimely fashion, so the the statute of limitations haven't passed. <laughs> but Chuck, what I what I'm trying to do is untangle the lies, the hall of mirrors, because the Church of Scientology. I got to tell you, I'm I'm analyzing it at the ScientologyMoneyProject.com. And it's designed to be deliberately evasive, misleading, dishonest, bad faith, unclean hands. Read that command channel booklet a couple of times just to get what their what their presentation of the top is. And then amongst the members themselves in your brain, you always know COB is the boss. I remember when I was there in 83 and we had the Christmas party at the end of 83 at the end base because I was on a project there. So I was like a, an outsider just sort of like being there for about six months. And then we did a survey. They did a survey. The, the base PR man, I forget his name. I mean, I think it was Phil Sherlock. He did, he did the survey of like, who do you want to speak at the, at the Christmas party? Like hands down, the people, the, the guy that everybody wanted to talk was David Miscavige. He was the number one. Uh, I think maybe either out of fear, but also out of like they knew he was the he was the guy. He's the top guy. He knew everything. He was the most closest to being on LRH's lines in 1983 of the base personnel. I mean, everybody knew about Pat Broker. He was he was known on the computer. If you typed his name in on the computer, his name was X X X. Wow. <laughs> you know, like you know, you type in a, uh, somebody's log on and then you press return. If you typed in XXX and pressed return, that was Pat Broker. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, he was. And then uh, at the uh, like, I, I don't know if I told you, but the Incom guy at that time for uh, the computer setups, I think, was the the SI computer guy, John uh, Dunn. And then I think some of the computer guys at Incom at Int at that time set up the computer system that went that stayed with uh, with Pat Broker at the ranch, so that they were still connected up by the by computer and stuff like that. But, I mean, you know, like there are these just tiny little details. No, but we'll check the, this period of, uh, of author services. They hire, uh, and I think uh, Denise Brennan hired the so-called ex-lawyers, Lenz, Glensk, and Hellers, outside non-Scientology tax lawyers to set up these elaborate structures. Part of the untold story is that David Miscavige was aided and abetted by attorneys, non-Scientology attorneys, Monique Yingling, Jerry Pfeffer, the Lenz brothers, Lawrence Heller, also by experts like Meet Emery, who, who was former IRS assistant commissioner. And by the way, I don't subscribe to the conspiracy theory. He was simply a hired consultant. He didn't have anything to do with taking over the church or the technology. So there's a, a lot of... Uh, opportunity for David Miscavige to step in and seize the reins of power, whether anyone realized that or not. It's quite possible that L. Ron Hubbard himself did not realize that David Miscavige would be his successor or would emerge as his successor. It's not in the writings anywhere. It's not clear. Hubbard was so, I think, okay, I was going to tell you about a conversation I had with Janice Grady, which is absolutely relevant because the gist of your question is how the hell did a guy like Miscavige assume the top decider role for the movement when that isn't what Hubbard said? And everybody, it, it's kind of like it caught everybody flat footed with the people at the top. It, you know, that that admission that you that that very striking admission that that uh, Miscavige made to John, uh, to sorry, Paul Grady, that you that you mentioned uh, oh, the power is assumed. Yes, the power is assumed. It, that's simply a very sort of like go-getter, opportunistic, you know, budding sociopath saying, "Wow, nobody else is doing shit around here. I'm gonna fucking take the power." You know, what I mean, that's basically the that's a, basically the thing. Because when you look at the players who were there at the time, there wasn't anybody who stood up and. Uh, uh, assumed the quote-unquote Hubbard boots in the sky. You know what I mean? 
It, it was an imaginary role, but I think that but it was there. I call that was an inadequacy the... on Hubbard's part. Hubbard built this whole elaborate bureaucratic C organization system. My conclusion is, is it's 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 another whole factor that you um, haven't even brought up, which is that we're talking about an organizational system, this massive Keystone Cops uh, system. And uh, part of the factor is a driving personality like Miscavige, assuming this top decider role, which Hubbard inadvertently leaves vacant, even though Hubbard's left policies, if, and this is one of the things, one of my beefs or things that I might have to do, which is to do like a summary of Hubbard's final writings and show the importance of his councils, the Watchdog Committee and the Executive Strata and the 1982 policies, which had to do with what's called coordinating committees. Hubbard's final uh, sort of like, uh, and if you look at the history of how we call it turning over his hats, I mean, Hubbard used to like pride himself with, you know, being worth, you know, hundreds of people, you know what I mean? And he's had to turn over all these hats and the organization is yeah. basically a, a, like a like a representation of the organizational, uh, you know, replacement of Hubbard's great, you know, like multitasking, you know, do everything, you know, one man, sh you know, he can really, you know, run the whole boat all by himself type of fantasy. Oh, that was in the, you know, even in his fake biography, he said that when he left in Navy position that he was relieved, relieved by 15 officers exactly, of rank. Exactly. Exactly. In other words, I was doing the work of 15 men. But you're, and not not to go on to that. But, okay. So to try to answer your question again and not to get too deflected, then yeah. me and Janice we agreed. Coordinating committee, coordinating committee, coordinating committee. That's how the movement was supposed to be run from the top. A coordinating committee. But on the other hand, in the author services advices, because I've thought long and hard about my conversation seriously with Janice, because I've played this sort of game of like, uh, you know, ultimate devil's advocate. How could we make this Hubbard system, <laughs> this crazy bureaucratic system work? The other factor is some of his traffic to author services when good old COBASI David Miscavige was there also included. And this is one of the reasons why. Uh, there's another whole five people's names that w I have to bring up. It's the uh, uh, the founding members of the ASI board of directors included, or, or maybe it was the founding members of the RTC Corporation included some names of people who then went on to be a position in author services, which was illegal. The LRH wanted this one position, which doesn't get much discussion except by me, and because it's just too stupid minutia. It's called the AVC position. But guess what? We can also right. get you can also when you're when you're talking to Dan Kuhn in future interviews. Hopefully, Marriott Lindstein, who was a later long term and in a very uh, I consider a pretty effective auth. I mean. AVC aid. She was the AVC p position, but the person who was the original uh, uh, AVC aid position that was a management position. It used to be in the in the LRH purse office, like I was saying. That was the old CR unit. That position then moved over to Author Services, but then that became an illegal uh, uh, point. You can't have the AVC aid in ASI because that means that the that you have this nonprofit corporation constantly approving and disapproving all of the strategic stuff that goes on in the church. Now that that rejection of the AVC role out of the author services then caused the setup of the corporate liaison office uh, position, which is what the one that Mark Fisher then assumed for like all the years that he assumed, and he would be one. I would love wow. to. I would. Your your question leads me to then think of ah, I should ask uh, how well. Did Mark Fisher uh, remember his relationship as CLIC when he was in the in the corporate liaison office? Because that was the that was another sort of uh, legal solution to allow for the um, the sort of like the 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 oversight jobs which are in the. ASI advices, which are part of ASI's function. ASI is also responsible for the L. Ron Hubbard image and the L. Ron Hubbard image in the church. Like that's that's one of their functions. And that can only be done uh, by somebody um, sort of like, the, it's sort of like a combination of the LRH PPRO hat, which had to be put in CMO in, in the church. It couldn't be in ASI, even though there is a man in, mm. in author services called Hugh Wilhair, who is the, uh, 
who's that LRH image person and has been, and he's a trained, he was a captain in the Army, a trained PR man, and he's the brother of Greg Wilhare. So the, the brothers and, the, and some of the familial connections inside of, of Scientology across the top corporations is also very fascinating. And I urged Lawrence Wright to please, please, please try to get a, a discussion with uh, Greg, um, with, uh, sorry, Hugh Wilhare. Hugh Wilhare is the uh, top PR guy in author service and, and has been for over 30 years. Hugh would be a, a wonderful defector if he ever defected. <laughs> I hope he does. I hope he does. Well, th this is an, a, an interesting can of worms to get into. We need someone who hasn't yet spoken out to speak out. Yes. Oh, I mean, there's so many people. I mean, Ray Midoff would be another intensely person. I mean, I always wish that the people who were last in conversations with Hubbard were would be allowed to frankly tell the actual conversations. He, I mean, uh, Sarge Stephen Fouth through Marty's book has told the the the, the most uh, best uh, final uh, statements of Hubbard, including on Marty's uh, blog where Sarge has written his uh, comments about his time with LRH and including um, mention of the fact that Ray Midoff was there. Ray Midoff was the, uh, the man who got to see Hubbard within the last two weeks of Hubbard's life whereas David Miscavige was not there. And that's sort of in line with uh, Hubbard's view of his senior technical person. Because remember, I don't know, you, you would remember this, but David, Miss, uh, David uh, Mayo, who had been the yes. senior case supervisor international back at an earlier time period, Hubbard placed tremendous trust in him. You've got you to realize that Hubbard himself was the, in his, in his mind, he had created this whole Scientology movement. And he trusted great trust to these people, and and he great he gave great trust to uh, David Mayo, and then subsequently uh, great great res trust went to Ray Midoff, who who replaced David Mayo. So there is a there is a continuity when you when and you're you can appreciate all these all these fine details. Well, sure, Chuck. And one of the million dollar questions is why didn't L. Ron Hubbard name a successor? He didn't wish Second. it that way. He didn't wish it that way. He thought that the that he thought that the uh, two top councils. See, if you truly, it's that blue book. I swear to God, that blue book, which is the command channels. The command channels. It is in there. It's written the very dryly. Pat and Annie Broker produced uh, uh, apparently something from Hubbard called the Loyal Officers. Yes. Is that was that even a real issue? Were they intended to take over? You know, here this gets into some truly fine, fine, fine points. I would, I would, you would have, we'd have to have an honest conversation with Pat Broker. Now here, I, I've told my take of how it could be that way. I'm an expert in thinking, hmm, how could Pat have thought that it was, he was justified in writing that issue? Because apparently he did write that issue. It was totally from him. Now, different people have different kind of condemnatory attitudes. When I play this ultra sort of like devil's advocate for Hubbard and all all things Hubbard and his final clique of three or four people that he allowed to be even around him, I can I can in my own mind very much think that Pat might have thought that he was justified in writing that issue. It was. But Chuck, we're up on the hour. We're going to leave it here. <laughs> and on uh, no, I mean this is all very fascinating and it has to be broken down. And I'll tell you something. I had an attorney tell me about the work I'm doing uh, and, and other people are doing. It's hard work to do. It's hard work to investigate, to research, to write, to analyze, find documents online. And that's why everyone doesn't do it because it's hard work. And Scientology's attorneys, they're non, these are non-Scientologists. People like Eric Lieberman in New York, you know, uh, people like Monique Yingling, people like uh, David Schindler here in L.A., they have deliberately made Scientology confusing, evasive. And, in my, and to summarize things, based on my years of research, the Church of Scientology International and its related affiliates want three things. One, they want to get all the money they can. Two, they want to harm and exploit people without any, any accountability whatsoever. Three, they never want to be sued. So what you wind up on the top of everything is a, a greedy group that wants never to be held accountable for its own actions. 
And that's ultimately whatever it was back then. It morphed into 2014 into an ugly, brutal, greedy machine that doesn't exist on paper. And, and what I mean by that, it's hard to figure out how to sue them, where to sue them, who to sue. It's hard to figure out who works for who. And this was deliberately designed that way. And as Mark Hadley said, Scientology doesn't make sense. So for people like us, we're trying to figure it out by asking hard questions and finding documents. And I appreciate your contributions over, you know, since the last 10 years to helping people figure out what it is and to just reaching out to help people who are wanting to leave the church. Chuck, I think that you've been such a tremendous asset to religious scholars, journalists, you, activists, you critics. Jeff, you, Jeff, are yeah. the number one amateur hobbyist tennis player in the Scientology commenting and understanding game. You absolutely, like, you're like wow. the, uh, who's, who's you. the guy who just won the, uh, the you know, the, the number one tennis position in the world? You are the sure. number one observer, and you're amateur, and you know more about Scientology than all anyone else alive. And, wow. and then in, in the media category, I give that to Tony Ortega. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll take that as a win, and we'll leave it at that because I do. It, it is an interesting, fascinating, not to crack, but crack it. I will, uh, along with other people, because the church should know we're not giving up. We will unravel you, decode you, decipher you, and if it takes a David Miscavige decoder ring to do it, well, I'll get one. <laughs> yeah. People like us, we will decode this thing, because really, at the very top level. All I'm doing, all so many of my friends are doing, my family, we just want the human rights abuses to end. Nobody cares if you practice Scientology. But until and unless they make human rights changes that are sweeping, until they stop abusing and harming people, we're not going to stop either. So they have a, you know, a very determined group of smart people figuring them out. So, Chuck, I appreciate everything, and uh, thank you for being on the air these uh, last two hours. And we'll, you're going to be a recurring guest because we still have a lot more to talk about. Always enjoy talking to you. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine, and as always, we'll be in very good 